Have we some uh, question for Didier, Brenda, and uh, David? Thank you very much for your presentations. I do need to say one more thing. I'm going to put my environmental hat on. If you're leaving, hopefully you'll come back tomorrow. If you're leaving and you can't come back tomorrow because you've got some so important thing that's even more important than listening to us, leave the plastic behind. We don't want to throw the plastic in the bin, we want to recycle them. And by the way, some of them have been used since 2011, so it's uh, <laughs> probably why some of them don't fit very well. But uh, leave your cards behind on that table in the blue bag. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask uh, in regards to the, the dangers that might come because of, the, of, of uh, reaching um, longevity escape velocity, because we all, we, we all look forward to reach it in some way. However, I wonder um, how we are going to manage with the dread and the fear uh, that comes out of being able to live forever or as long as we wish. Uh, given that uh, since we are not going to die because of aging, we might be able, we, we, we will die because of any other cops, even if it's a car on the street or any other way. So I wonder how we're going to deal with this anxiety uh, that comes out of uh, not dying because of aging. That's a question about psychology in some ways. And uh, we need to study psychology. There's a lot of psychological aspects in here. Why are some people afraid of this? People are afraid of this because they're afraid to get their hopes up. They say, well, I don't want to get my hopes up because I'm sure I'll, my hopes will be dashed and it's going to be so terrible, so I'm not going to allow myself to get my hopes up. So I'm going to pretend, even to myself, that I don't want this. In reality, what will happen is we'll be a bit safer. We will uh, make our bodies more robust, but we probably won't indulge in dangerous sports in quite the same way anymore because we will enjoy our lives so much. And there will be better repair mechanisms. I'm not saying that I want to encourage people to drive fast and reckless cars, but we'll have self-driving cars, which probably won't crash. Did you have a, a big question, and I'm sorry for being a bit glib. We can maybe talk more I about that later. Oh, do you want to add uh, something about this question about psychology? <laughs> well, uh, many, many, many things to add, but uh, one of the things is some, sometimes I'm, I'm very surprised by people saying, oh, yes, but if we don't die anymore of old age, we will be uh, too careful, you know, but I think it's very uh, a world where we where we would be more careful because we once we eliminate uh, diseases related to old age, there will be other uh, ways to die, and we will try to eliminate them all, all as well. So I think a, a world where we will be more careful is a better world, not a worst worst world. world. This is very important. Also, especially in, in uh, the actual situation where we progress in the possibilities to destroy ourselves. Cryonics. Ne next question. Um, thank you, and, and Dave, yeah. David, David. Well, you, you answered, because he, his question wasn't an Which, no. cryonics? I did. Did you, uh, did you answer cryonics? No, I, I don't think it's, uh, okay, the answer, yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's your answer is quite big. <laughs> Let's see. Cryonics. <laughs> we did. Natasha's answer there is that we might have a, such a bad accident that we can't repair ourselves straight away, even with the technology maybe of the 2040s, but that we'll be able to catch enough of the brain so that either by biological cryonics or by uh, plastination cryonics, I'm sorry I got the terminology wrong, I, but by scanning the brain or preserving the brain, one of the two of them, and that's an interesting discussion as to which is more likely to succeed. Uh, that will take a long time, but two, both of them are in principle viable. So maybe when people do have accidents in the 2040s, once we've reached LEV, where they can be preserved for a while, and then uh, with the technology of the 2060s, when we've gone beyond AGI to ASI or whatever, that will be able to reconstruct people from either a chemical copy of their brain or a digital copy of their brain. Thank you um, again, David, <coughs> specifically for um, um, the longevity uh, story that you told. There is one big thing that really concerns me, um, and to um, to extend a little bit on your 
um, flying analogy. There are so many people in the world today who never flown. Um, how can we ensure that this comes available for everybody? That if we are talking about democratization, how can we democratize this? And, and I'm meaning this very seriously, because there is now a huge amount of people flocking around longevity because there is the big money and the big money as you know always costs a lot of money for the people who are starting with that and they are always ahead of the rest so will there be not a big divide bigger than we, than we see now not that this is not very very valuable I, I think it's very valuable, but the side effect of that that I just mentioned is my big concern. Thank you. I, the mic, I, I, I will, there, are, there are many, many, many answers. The first one, the classical transhumanist uh, answer is to, say, to speak about this, you know. It used to be, when I was young uh, enough to have not this one, it used to be uh, many uh, left-wing people were saying, oh, it will be uh, only for rich. And now it's literally for the majority of the citizens in the world. The second aspect is when you take a look at the uh, life expectancy today compared to uh, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, the difference between the richest people and the poorest people is smaller. The third answer is, Let's imagine now that uh, somebody is finding the pill for, uh, between brackets, uh, immortality, immortality. Uh, it will be better to have it for everybody than to have it only for a few, because it would be so disruptive to give it only to for a few, that even for the rich pe richest people, it would be better to have it for everybody. And then, of course, there is a risk uh, that uh, in the first time, it will be uh, for rich only, that's why, in my opinion, but, uh, we need more uh, research, especially in Europe, where we have a lot of public money uh, for this, and where, by the way, people are living in average and also uh, in average longer than far, lo uh, f a lot longer than uh, in uh, the US, because among other things of the more equal political system, but not only about this, not about for this. And then one there. Um, a very important question, and one that has been a problem for us in Africa, and I'm using this example, I spoke about access to quality, um, healthcare, and all of that. This looks like something that would really, really just broaden that divide. But for us at Afro Longevity, we think one of the things that will help bridge that gap is the collaboration between public institutions, private institutions, academia, making sure that politics or political leaders are also involved. Because if you look at the amount of money that's being spent on sick care, if you can convince those policy makers to take a portion of that and invest it in longevity, it means some of these solutions will be available for everyone. There's a lot of talk about universal health care as well, making sure that those two tiers come together, that this is made available to everyone. But we need to start it now. And the awareness, the education of how we reach that level becomes very important. Education for everybody involved. I think for me, that might be able to solve that problem. The, next, uh, the, the yeah, best the book one. I've seen on inequality recently is by Peter Turchin. It's called End Times. And he says that some inequalities are being handled by like smartphones. Smartphones and many other goods are available to everybody, more or less, surprisingly. When I started with smartphones back in the 1990s, we had no conception that they really would be used by billions of people. We thought they would be the drug dealers, the business people, and uh, a few tech geeks would be using them. So it's astonishing. So that's one aspect of it. But there are three types of inequality that have got much worse in many parts of the world. And that is the cost of access to good education, the cost of access to good housing, 
and the cost of access to good health care. That's where more and more people are being left behind for dysfunctional markets in all three of these cases. The market is not doing what it's meant to be doing. It's got all kinds of market failures due to the powers of monopolies and intellectual property rights. I do recommend that book, by the way, Peter Turkin. It's the best book I've read this year so far. It's called uh, uh, The End Times. But uh, there are certainly scenarios in which uh, these treatments for rejuvenation will be like smartphones and come down, but there are also scenarios, credible scenarios, worrying and sad scenarios in which they'll be dominated by high, powerful, big tech companies, big pharma, which is why the answers that my two colleagues on stage have given are exactly right. The way to deal with this is better politics. To encourage the elites, so-called, to see that it's in their self-interest to share this rather than trying to hang on to it for as much money as possible. And in the past, uh, sometimes uh, the wealthy and the elites realized it was good to give away some of their power and share it for the sake of a better society. And in some cases, instead, it was revolution. I fear that there is revolutions ahead because of lack of attention to these questions of equality. Which is why when I finished my book in 2016, The Abolition of Aging, I listed some of the what I said about today, but I said, what's the thing that will stop us getting there? My number one reason was bad politics. And if we have bad politics, which allows big, powerful groups to stamp all over the common good, we may not get to that wonderful future. So the case of getting to that wonderful future requires, what did I say? Narratives and community. And when I said re-engineering the community, of course, it's re-engineering the scientific community, so we focus on it. But more generally, it's re-engineering how we work together as a society so that there are fair access to all the important things. So I've gone on a bit about that, but it is a long and big and important topic. Yeah. Now, then, the, Sorry, I, I want to add... Yeah, I want to add one questions. thing about the difference between uh, um, having uh, people taking planes or, you know, very expensive uh, cars and uh, medical science is concerning medical science what is very expensive is research after that the drugs it can be very very cheap, cheap. for example one of the promising drugs is uh, uh, metformin in belgium it's literally zero you know I, I had a cardiac accident a few years ago i pay zero uh, i don't have to pay for the metformin it doesn't cost uh, almost anything because there is no more patent next question from here Hi, right. um, there's actually uh, two short things. First off, um, if I remember correctly, um, you discussed the aspect of shame in the pro-aging trends. Would you argue that there is a good strategy to be had to use media um, to um, reverse this and make it publicly shameful to come out as accepting death? like using peer pressure and other forms of cultural engineering to make it a taboo to say like I want to die or I'm okay with dying. So it's, more, it's better to be positive but uh, I think uh, we, should, we need more uh, soap operas and so on in which the people who live long aren't uh, selfish, greedy people like in some of the stories that we've seen, uh, Death Becomes Her or Highlander or some of the other things. There are a f much fewer cases in which the people who live much longer are deemed as good characters. But there are places around the world in which that trope is being reversed and we need to be clever at doing this. And yeah, there might be some impl impl implication of you are bad if you are thinking that it's okay for your elderly parents to die, you know? You're bad if you let your elderly parents die if they don't have chronics arrangements, for example. We need to uh, get that. Nowadays we're told you're bad if you die without a will, without making arrangements for the next generation. But we should be saying, you know, it's morally responsible to seek to let people live long enough to have a chance to take part in this uh, longevity escape velocity in 2040. It's morally the right thing to do, to allow people to live long enough to live forever. Uh, uh, a question from here, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, please correct me if, if, my, uh, if I'm wrong. Um, I've seen so many um, studies in vitro, in animals. Uh, my question is, 
are there already studies being done in humans with, I don't know, uh, rapamycin, metformin, and if you foresee these, um, let's say, therapies or medicines being used in public health? The best research that I've seen is by an organization called Forever Healthy, so they're led by a German called Michael Graver. He actually made a lot of money uh, in the internet in the early days of the German internet, and he has applied his uh, finances to back the use of a uh, non-commercial mind. He's not making any money out of these research studies at all. So they do say, here's the evidence as to the kinds of uses of rapamycin that are likely to be positive, and here are others that are uh, unlikely to be positive. And by the way, if you turn behind, you can see Sven Butlerich standing up there. Sven can give you some consultancy on exactly this point, because Sven, amongst others, who is the co-founder of HEALS, along with Didier, deals is, Didier is sort of the economic and the political brain of HEALS, and Sven's the scientific brain of HEALS, if I kind of or stereotype too much, so he will be able to tell you about the, exactly the kind of studies that you're looking for. They have been done, but I wish there were many more, and I wish they were done by people like Michael Graver's organization who don't have a commercial interest in the outcome. Also look at what is done by the Longevity Foundation by Bill Falloon, Life Extension Foundation, I'm sorry. Uh, he has lots of good results too, but uh, I think... Hmm? And there is also uh, a group of about uh, 2,000 people, but I forgot the name now. Uh, it's called Olympic Rejuvenation. Helps <laughs> help me. Uh, this guy, uh, very Brian rich in uh, Brian, Brian Johnson. Sorry, I was looking. And I want to add one thing for me. Uh, sadly, there is one thing where we kind of disagree. <laughs> Uh, concerning the uh, maximal lifespan, I insist about the fact that at the moment we don't progress at all still. And I always say if you give, give uh, one billion dollars to the best scientists in the world and you give them 100 mice, no mice will live longer than four years. And I hope it will change pretty soon, but at the moment this is the biggest problem. And at the moment, you have the best coach of the world. You will maybe live a few years more. But yeah, once again, uh, uh, John Calmont died already more than 25 years ago. And uh, the oldest person uh, at the moment is uh, six years less than was uh, um, John Calmont, even if there are some controversies maybe uh, okay, about uh, real age. Last question, uh, Natasha. <laughs> First, a uh, shout out to Afro Longevity. Major, a, a great event. Just a shout out, but that's not my question. My question goes to um, David. Why the, um, the uh, is it um, gel nav or nav gel senolytics? Why that particular combination? Nav gel, I think that's it. Nav gel? Um. You have to ask the scientific team behind that. Uh, her name is Caitlin Lewis, and uh, with advice from Opry de Great. They do explain a little bit about it. Uh, they wanted to find something that is, it's innovative in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so there's uh, a senolytic, but it's also the method of delivery of that senolytic is okay. innovation. So I think one of these two words is to do with the mechanism of delivery. And I wish I could remember the answer, but uh, you should look up on our website or I can dig it out. But they're, they're, we spent a long time, or rather, Caitlin and Aubrey spent a long time figuring out which of the four treatments to be done, and an awful long time figuring out what we'll do in RMR2 as well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to our three speakers.